go ahead and push this record button that I've hit and I'll and I'll say welcome to our recording our recording folks who are, have joined us thank you so much for pushing a few buttons and watching the recording of this and as I was saying earlier to our our live our live participants our live students is that uh, initially I was going to have the English uh, translations today. I was going to give you a, an overview of all the translations, give you some give you some ideas around why we have so many translations and how languages work and how this translation process work. Try to put that all together for you so you can have uh, confidence that uh, our Bibles have been translated properly. As I was looking at the flow of this, I decided to move everything up a week and add something on to the end of it. And I think it'll kind of dovetail into the story, which we start on August the 25th. I think it'll dovetail into that a little better. On the calendar, uh, you can just note on your calendar that we do have only about three more sessions left until we go into the story. So if you have not registered, uh, please go ahead and do so. The information's gone out by email. And I'll probably put out a text later on this week. Uh, you can call me, you can email, you can do it online, whatever works for you. But make sure to go ahead and register so I can make sure I know a good count and make sure that I have enough uh, books for everyone. I, I do have just a couple of uh, announcements uh, that I wanted to make. We do have uh, a couple families uh, who uh, have lost some, some loved ones. Uh, let me get my notes here to make sure that I say the right things. There we go. Uh, the first is that uh, some of you have heard that Sheila Sharp had lost her father, uh, Leander Tobin Hill, uh, had, had uh, passed away just recently. And so this Friday, uh, which is August the 6th, from 9 to 1030 at Greater Warner AME Zion Church, there will be a uh, visitation. There'll be a walkthrough that you can pay your respects. And uh, Reverend Kessler, I believe, is actually uh, doing the funeral for that. But again, Friday from 9 to 1030 at Greater Warner is uh, Sheila, Sh Sheila Sharp's father, Leander Tobin Hill. The second one is uh, some of you have noticed that uh, in the announcements and so forth that Mardell Henry had passed away. And that is the uh, sister of Willie and Willie May Howard, uh, both of them. And so that uh, walkthrough is going to be on Monday, uh, this coming Monday from 930 to 1030 here at Mount Calvary Baptist Church. So Monday, 930 to 1030, Mardell Henry's uh, walkthrough. And those are just a couple of things that have popped up on the calendar. Make sure that you're, you stay informed and know where to be and when and when to be uh, when to be early. So let me um, just kind of lay, lay the groundwork for what we're actually going to be doing for the next couple of weeks. As I peruse all kinds of videos and research through books and uh, do all kinds of things around a certain subject, once in a while I, I come across I come across videos that I think are just so good uh, I couldn't do them justice. And um, this is the little secret that I have. I, I, a lot of times I wrap up a lot of research and I'll take part of this video, part of this book, put things together and um, try to do all of it justice. But once in a while, I'll come across a video that I just have to show you. And the person does such a good job of conveying the information uh, that I have to show you directly. Uh, and, and, I do, and I do that because they do such a, a good job and also because I know you don't want to hear my voice all the time. So I try to give you some, some variety and some, and some videos. For the next two weeks, we are going to be hearing from a person called Vodi or Vodi. I've heard it pronounced both ways, Bakum. Uh, Vodi Bakum. I'll go ahead and share my screen and give you an idea of this person's uh, spelling. And as you can see here, it says why you can believe the Bible part one. We'll do part two next time. Uh, for, the, for about the next hour, 
we're going to be listening to him lecture. Uh, and so uh, get comfortable. It's, he makes it entertaining. He makes it very informative. And let me go ahead and there he is. And he has an interesting name. Uh, once you get past the name, uh, then you can, <laughs> then uh, it gets a little better. I've heard his name pronounced Voody, and I've also heard it pronounced Vody, but his last name is Bakum. And as I've mentioned, just about in every session that we've had in this series, How We Got the Bible, I pray that you get a confidence that you can trust the Bible. And through that trust, you grow closer to God and you grow in your relationship with God. This particular lecture uh, in two parts, the first part tonight is going to be all lecture. The second video, which we'll see next week, is going to be is, is question and answer. He's lecturing at a church, and uh, they actually he actually takes questions, and I thought it would, would be very good for us to see uh, both parts. I'm going to go ahead and introduce him, and uh, uh, just to give you a flavor of, of, of who he is and what he's about, I pulled up his website. I've known him for a few, no, well, I've known of him for a few years, I've listened to a lot of his videos, read a couple of his books. He is controver controversial in some areas of doctrine. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with him in everything. Uh, and by the way, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't met anybody that, that I agree with in everything or anyone who agrees with me in everything. Uh, but I found him to be doctrinally sound, theologically sound. Um, and, and so here is just an introduction, and you can just listen to it just to get a feel for him before we sh I show the, the, the video. Dr. Bauckham, uh wears many hats. He's a husband. He's a father. He's a former pastor. He's an author. He's a professor, a conference speaker, and a church planner. He currently serves as dean of theology at African uh, Christian University and Lusaka, Zambia. Uh, he uh, makes the Bible clear. He demonstrates the relevance of God's word to everyday life. However, he does so without compromising the centrality of Christ and the gospel. Those who hear him preach find themselves both challenged and encouraged. And that's one of the things I like about him is he does challenge you. Vody's area of emphasis is actually cultural apologetics. Remember, apologetics is not someone who goes around apologizing, but defends the faith, defends the Christian faith. Whether teaching and on classical apologetic issues like the validity and historic, historicity of the Bible, or the resurrection of Christ, or teaching on biblical manhood and womanhood, marriage and family, he helps ordinary people understand the significance of thinking and living biblically in every area of life. He's very practical and he's very down to earth and it's, uh, and it's great. Uh, now in his bio, his bio is quite long, but I've condensed it down and, and, and it's really impossible to, to understand his approach to the Bible without first understanding uh, how he uh, has walked, how he was raised. He was actually raised in a non-Christian single parent home and Vody did not actually hear the gospel until he was in college. His mother, a single mother, was a Buddhist, and she passed on. She tried to pass on some of her Buddhist faith, Buddhist faith, onto him, but it didn't quite uh, quite take. Uh, his journey to faith was very unusual, and it was an intellectual one. Uh, as a result, he understands what it means to be a skeptic. And he knows what it's like to try to figure out uh, the Christian life without relying on the traditions of men. As a result, he speaks to, quote, outsiders in ways few uh, Bible teachers can. Now, just to give you a, uh, an idea of his background, because he does have a doctorate, he holds degrees from uh, Houston Baptist University, um, also Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and also Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, where he got his doctorate. Um, and then he has an honorary uh, doctorate from Southern California Seminary. He's also done postgraduate study at the University of Oxford 
in uh, that's Oxford, England, not Oxford, uh, Alabama. Um, and he has a wife, and they are they've been married since uh, the late 1980s, uh, about 1989, I believe. And they have nine children. God bless them. He has nine children. Uh, and so that's just to give you an idea of what he uh, does. He, he's, uh, not many people know this, but he's actually a martial arts, um, um, I don't want to say instructor, but he's into martial arts. He's quite good. He has won tournaments and he has titles uh, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and he's a voice actor. He does voiceovers uh, for films like, I don't know if you saw George Washington Carver, An Unco Uncommon Way, An Uncommon Way. He did voiceover for that. And also a national the uh, theatrical release, Genesis, Paradise Lost. So he's got a, a, a wide, uh, a very wide background. Now, let me um, just give you a preview of your personal study so you can keep this in mind when you're going through the video. This coming week for your personal study, I want you to watch this video again. Uh, you're going to watch it now, but sometime during the week, I want you to watch it again, and you can pull it up directly either from YouTube or you can watch our recorded Bible study session, and I'll send you links uh, out by text and by email so that you can have it. But I want you to watch this a total of two times. And I, I want you to take a few notes. Uh, don't try to take down everything, but what are his main points? He, he hammers home two or three main points pretty hard. And so uh, see if you can capture that somehow in your own words and maybe jot down a few notes. If you want to jot down some notes, uh, you, can, you can turn to page 93 in your uh, participant guide, page 93 in the back. There's some, if you haven't already filled it up, there's some uh, paper there, uh, some blank sheets that you can, some blank pages you can use there. So you can jot down some notes. And then lastly, most importantly, as he's going through his lecture, I want you to think of three questions that you would have for him. Imagine yourself sitting in this lecture hall or in this classroom. It's actually a classroom within a, a, a large Baptist church. And you're jotting notes down, but you do have some questions. So I want you to engage him at that level. And sometime this week, write down two or three questions that you would have for him if he was, uh, if you were there. So that's what we're going to be doing together in a personal study coming up. Any questions on that before I show the video? Any questions at all? All right. Well, wonderful. Let me get my screen ready here. I'll uh, pull the video up, make it, make it big, and then pull everybody up. And I'll share my screen, optimize for video. And uh, like I say before every video, uh, you may have to tweak your, your voice or your, your level of volume on your device up or down. I'm not sure how this is gonna come out on your side. So you may have to adjust your volume. Here we go. Tonight I have an opportunity to address an issue that I think is of utmost importance. I believe that tonight we're going to deal with answering the most important question for any Christian to answer. Um, now, as I say that, for those in the room who are, are Christians, you're probably thinking that, well, I, I don't know, the most important question is probably, you know, what must I do to be saved? Or maybe the most important question is whatever, fill in the blank. But once you've answered that question, there's another question that's going to be asked. And that question is going to have to do with the authority upon which you base your answer. And so ultimately, you're going to have to answer the question, why the Bible? Why do you choose to believe the Bible? Why the Bible above other books? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Why the Bible above um, other books? Why the Bible instead of other books um, because ultimately um, everybody has their own you know set of beliefs everybody has their own set of books um, 
everybody ascribes various authority to these books. So that's a question that we need to answer. It's a question that people are right to ask. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you're right to ask this question. You're right to want to know the answer to this question. It is the critical point. This is the crux of the matter. Why the Bible? Because everything else that we discuss, um, everything else that you discuss with a Christian person um, is going to hinge upon that question. Why the Bible? And so I, I want us to answer that question. Um, as we begin to answer that question, I'm reminded of uh, a group of students that I spoke to at a university in the United States. It was one of the Ivy League schools. It was at Dartmouth. And I was there um, sharing for a couple of days. And we talked about these and, and other uh, sort of apologetic type issues. And this is uh, one of the questions that was raised and people wanted to know sort of, you know, how to deal with this and how to respond to this. Everywhere that I go, Christians, Christians young and old want to know how to deal with this issue and how to respond to this issue. Um, and so I did. I, I shared with the students there, you know, how to deal with this and how to answer this and shared with them why it was important, told them the story of, you know, the, the professor on the college campus in a lecture hall, probably not unlike this one. Um, there are those professors who are eager to engage Christian students, especially early in their college experience, uh, because there are some people who feel like it is their duty, it is their obligation to disabuse college students of the myths that they have come to believe. And uh, they see Christianity and a belief in the Bible as, as one of those myths. And so the professors usually have an encounter that goes something like this. Um, there's an issue that's raised in class. And there's uh, a student, Christian student, who, who disagrees, who takes issue with whatever it is that's been raised. And so the, the student raises their hand, and they have a problem, and they say, I have a problem. Here's my problem with that. That's wrong. It's wrong because of, you know, whatever. So here's issue A. And then here's their objection to issue A. I object to it because it's wrong. Okay, excellent. You object to it because it's wrong, but based on what authority? And then the student will say, well, the Bible says, da 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 Now the professor starts to salivate. <laughs> it's about to get good right now. Because the Bible says, okay, great. So then the question comes, why the Bible as opposed to any other authority? Why the Bible and not the Quran? Why, why the Bible and not the teachings of Confucius or the Maharishi Mahashyogi or the guy who lives down the road? Why, I mean, why not, you know? And then the student is going to have to answer that question. And unfortunately, for most Christians, there are one of a couple of answers that we are accustomed to giving. Um, we'll start with the worst. <laughs> and the worst one is this. <laughs> well, I believe the Bible because, because that's the way I was raised. At this point, it's hard for the professor not to grin just openly in front of everyone. He hopes this is the answer that's come, you know, because it's how you were raised. It's interesting that you believe this, and yet your authority is the Bible because that's how you were raised. And yet, you sit here on a college campus asking me to teach you things. Evidently, your Bible is not all that sufficient, is it? your Bible was capable of giving you all this knowledge, why do you need me? Secondly, if your parents who raised you were capable of giving you all the answers, then why is it that you need me? Thirdly, have you not already learned things about which your parents were wrong? Thank you very much. So your parents are fallible. You know, by the time you get to a, a room like this, you know your parents are fallible. You know they told you things that just weren't true, you know? You go out in the cold and they tell you put a hat on, you know, so that you don't get a cold. And then you learn that a cold is a virus and you can't catch it through the top of your head. And you're like, you know, that just <laughs> lied to me, you know. Stop looking like that or your face will get stuck like that. Well, no, it won't, you know. All these things that they told you, they just weren't true. But this Bible thing, you believe that. Now all of a sudden we're in trouble. Here's the other thing. You believe your Bible, but other people were raised to believe other holy books. So ultimately, if all you have is that's the way I was raised, then you 
and the Muslim and the Buddhist and whomever else are ultimately just engaged in a you know, mature version of my dad's bigger than your dad, right? I mean, ultimately, that's how I was raised. Well, fine, this is how I was raised. You know, well, my parents have raised me better than your parents raised you. That's all we got. Well, there's another possible response. And in this day and age, we really like this response because we believe that that experience trumps all. You know, you can't argue with a person's experience. And so we'll say something like, well, 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 I tried it and it changed my life. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> That's awesome. You tried it and it changed your life. Because you're the only person who's ever tried anything and it's changed their life, right? And maybe he'll tell you a story. He'll tell you a story about a guy who was from the United States. He was raised, born and raised in the Midwest, part of a large family. Mother had mental problems. Father was murdered when he was young. He ended up having to go to Boston to live with his oldest sister. But there when he was in Boston, he ran into a crowd that was quite unsavory. And having run into this crowd that was quite unsavory, he became quite unsavory. And before too long, he found himself in prison in Massachusetts. In prison in Massachusetts, there's some men who approached him about his need for his life to be changed. They approached him about this Messiah that he needed to meet and encounter and to whom he needed to bow the knee. But he couldn't. He simply could not until one night in his cell he had a personal, vivid encounter with this Messiah. And he bowed the knee. His entire life changed. He became a model prisoner. Ended up getting out of prison early. Became one of the most famous preachers in the United States. There are streets named after him to this day. He was responsible personally for opening over, opening over 100 houses of worship. Um, his name was Malcolm X. His Messiah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, whom he later came to realize was a fraud. So he left the Nation of Islam, actually became an Orthodox Muslim, and then the Nation of Islam assassinated him. So he had an experience. It changed his life. And he was wrong. And by the end of his life, he knew he was wrong. That encounter in his cell in prison was fraudulent. And yet he based everything on it. Or how about the guy who went to Alcoholics Anonymous and, you know, and he's going through these 12 steps and he gets to, I believe, what is probably step three or so, and he had to declare a higher power. He didn't want any of the religions, but there's this light that comes on and off outside his room, you know, every night and every morning, and he just says, for grins and giggles, that's going to be my higher power. This light that goes on and off every evening outside of his room. He hasn't had a drink in over a year, which means that according to your logic, his light has as much authority as your Bible. Because he tried it, and it changed his life. Well, I know that look. <laughs> Some of y'all are saying, okay, you took my two best answers. I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping you're going to give me another one. You know? And I will. I'll give you the answer that I gave to that group there um, at Dartmouth and how to deal with situations like this and specifically with them in dealing with the situation with the professor. I got an email about a week later, and the young lady who was at that meeting, she emailed me and she said, it happened, it happened, it happened. Just like you said, it would happen. We're there in class, it was a biology class, they're bringing up something, they're talking about some evolutionary stuff, and I, I just, I don't know, next thing I knew, my hand was in the air, and I said something, and he goes, well, you know, why do you object to this? And I said, the Bible. And, you know, I, she goes, I know it didn't happen, but I could see him salivating in my mind, just like you said, you know. His eyes just got all big, and then he just goes, question me, you know, why do you believe the Bible? And so I just gave him the answer that you gave. So she looked at her professor, and she said, I choose to believe the Bible 
because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. And so the professor said, I'll have to get back to you. The gentleman up here says, can you write that down for us? <laughs> no. But I'll do you one better. I'll teach it to you tonight. Okay? All right. But I'll, I'll do you even one better than that. I'll show you where it came from. If you have your Bibles, you can open to um, 2 Peter chapter 1. If you don't have your Bible, look on with someone. 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. I know some people are already upset, you know, because they're going, well, you, you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible. That's circular reasoning. Um, my goal here is not to prove the Bible. My goal here is to answer the question. The question is why I choose to believe the Bible, okay? I'm not here to prove the Bible. I'm not here to defend the Bible. I agree with Charles Spurgeon. I would no more defend the Bible than I would defend a lion. You don't defend a lion. You just let him loose. He'll defend himself. <laughs> Amen? We went and saw some lions today. They didn't need any defending, Okay? So I'm not here, I'm not here to, 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 to defend the Bible. Um, I'm here to answer that question. I'm here, to, I'm here to explain to you why I choose to believe the Bible. And the answer to that question, for me, resides in the Bible itself. Now, why would I appeal to the Bible in this way? Because there is no higher authority than the Bible. If there is no higher... See, if I were to appeal to another authority, I would be conceding the fact that there's a higher authority than the Bible. So this might be a problem in any other area and any other field. However, I'm making the argument that this is the highest authority. Therefore, by definition, I cannot appeal to another authority. Okay? All right. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning of verse 16. Peter writes, and again, he's, re he's responding. Notice he's responding to questions and or accusations about the authority of of the scriptures. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So there's Peter's response. Now, for it is, it is this, from this response that I derived the answer that I gave to you. So I'll give it to you step by step because every point here is important. Um, first, it's a reliable collection of historical documents. Can you say that with me? It's a reliable collection of historical documents. Say it again. It's a reliable collection of historical documents. One more time. It's a reliable collection of historical documents. This is important. Um, it's important that it's reliable, it's important that it's a collection, it's important that it's historical. All of these things are important, that we have a collection of historical documents. Now, the Bible is unlike um, many other holy books in that the Bible is actually a collection. Um, you, you don't have just one individual who says that he heard from God and everybody has to listen to him. It is actually a collection. Um, the Bible was written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. The Bible was written in three different languages, mainly Hebrew and Greek, with a little bit of Aramaic. 
Um, the Bible was written by over 40 authors from multiple walks of life. Um, we have people who were kings and generals, people who were fishermen, um, you know, tax collectors. We have people from you know, doctors, um, historians. We have people from all walks of life, over 40 different authors from all sort of walks of life who give us 66 volumes. These 66 volumes cover hundreds of various subjects. They were written over a period of more than 1,500 years. Now let me recap. Three continents, three languages, more than 40 authors, hundreds of subjects and topics written over a period of 1,500 years. This is a reliable collection of historical documents. It is not just one individual making a claim. This is incredibly important. Oftentimes we don't think about the Bible in this way. You know, we just think about the, the, the book that we have, you know. We don't, we don't comprehend um, that all of this came together in order to give us the Bible, okay? And this actually adds to the credibility of the Bible, the fact that it is a reliable collection of historical documents. Listen to this from Luke's gospel. Um, Luke was a physician and a historian, and Dr. Luke writes, chapter 1, verse 1 of his gospel, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have blind faith in what I... No. That you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Here's what's interesting. Luke was not an eyewitness. He doesn't claim to be an eyewitness. He's a historian who claims to have traced the information from the eyewitnesses. A lot of people say, you know, why do we have to have four gospels? Well, because all of these gospels are telling the same story from different perspectives. And the fact that this man was not an eyewitness, but collected information from individuals who were eyewitnesses, um, some of the, his chief eyewitnesses um, interestingly enough, happen to be female uh, eyewitnesses. Um, that's why we get much, many things from Mary's perspective, uh, because Mary and Peter were two of the main eyewitnesses that he relied upon. Uh, but anyway, he, he gets information from eyewitnesses. And he openly says that he wasn't an eyewitness, but that he collected the information from the eyewitnesses, and that he has followed everything closely for some time past. And he wanted to write an orderly account. Here's another reason why we have multiple Gospels. Luke's goal is history and chronology. Okay? Luke's goal is, I want to give you the things as they happened in order. John's goal is evangelism. John says, clearly, I write these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. So his goal is evangelism. John, that's, so John orders his gospel around seven major signs. That's the way he organizes his gospel. Mark's, gosp, Mark's gospel is the shortest of the gospels. Mark is about brevity. And Mark, his, his favorite, you know, one of his favorite words is, you know, straight away. And straight away and immediately, okay? And he's just boom, 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 you know? And it is brief. He, just the facts, ma'am. That's Mark's goal. Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, and he wants to demonstrate that Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah. So Matthew's gospel emphasizes these things. That's why, for example, he starts with a genealogy, okay? So Matthew's pointing backwards. That's why we have his gospel written the way that it's written. Um, if we have time, I'll, I'll talk more about that. But just know that the idea here is that we have a reliable collection of historical documents. Luke is saying here in no uncertain terms, this is an historical document. Notice what Peter says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
In other words, these weren't myths. These weren't a collection of myths. These were, these were facts. But notice the next phrase. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Here's the second part. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. Can you add that with me? Let's say it together. A reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. One more time. A reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. He says we were eyewitnesses. Go uh, with me, if you will, over to 1 John. 1 John. Couple of pages over. First John. And watch what happens in First John, chapter one, beginning at verse one. Watch what he says here. Notice his choice of words. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Think he's trying to make a point there? I don't know. Maybe verse 2 will help. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. How about verse 3? This, this ought to maybe this ought, this ought to maybe give us some idea of what he's aiming at here, right? That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. We've seen, we've heard, we've touched Folks, we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. This is important. These weren't people who later on had a vision. These were people who were eyewitnesses to events. And we're not just talking about New Testament, New Testament and Old Testament. We're talking about eyewitnesses to events who wrote about events that they saw themselves. So we have a reliable collection of historical documents. That's good. But we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. That's even better. But they're written during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. Let's add that one. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. One more time. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. Come on now. Together, we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. That is incredibly important. There are a lot of people who don't like that, don't believe that, who argue with that. Um, they want to date the Bible late and so on and so forth. Um, but there's a huge problem there. Uh, go with me to 1 Corinthians. Now we're going to go backwards. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is Paul writing here. This is very important. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that would be Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Stop. If you do the math, there are at least 301 eyewitnesses to the resurrection who were alive when 1 Corinthians was written. At least 301 eyewitnesses to the resurrection who were still alive, who were still alive, who were still alive when 1 Corinthians was written. Now, before we move on from here, we're on a college campus, so I need to address this issue because there's always, you know, the, 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 the smart guy who goes, well, you know, you got a real problem here because, you know, you said there that he, was, you know, he, he, he appeared to Cephas or to Peter and then to the 12. You got a problem. That's one of, the, that's one of those contradictions in the Bible right there. Why? Well, because Judas hanged himself. 
How could he appear to the twelve if Judas hanged himself? He would only have appeared to eleven because Judas had already hanged himself. That's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, that would appear to be a contradiction. And unless you read like the rest of the Bible. <laughs> because then you would discover that in Acts chapter 1, Judas is replaced by Matthias. And the requirements was that he would have been an eyewitness to everything from the beginning. You see, the 12, that was an important number. That's why they replaced number 12 when he hanged himself, so that there would still be a 12. And by definition, being in the 12 meant that you had to be a witness to the resurrection. So there's no contradiction here. But thanks for playing. <laughs> but that just goes to the heart of our presuppositions when we read the Bible. You know? There are those who read the Bible like a judge, trying to find something wrong, trying to find something, working hard to find something wrong. And you know what I've found is that when people are reading the Bible like that, they, they have all these aha moments. Aha! And then you answer. And they don't go, wow, I was so wrong. They just go, okay, fine. I'll find another one. <laughs> you know? There have been 25,000, more than 25,000 archaeological digs related directly to the subject matter of the Bible. Over 25,000. Not one of them has contradicted anything that we have in the, Bible, in the Bible. And the overwhelming majority of them have confirmed and affirmed the things that we find in the Bible. But here's what's interesting. When you find something in the Bible, and as we've done thousands upon thousands of times, that confirms something in the Bible, there were individuals in the Bible, Quirinius, Quirinius was no governor. We've never found his name anywhere. So you find Quirinius' name in an archaeological dig, and those people don't go, oh, we were wrong. Please forgive us. They just go, whatever. We'll look somewhere. You know what I'm, And it's nothing. And you don't hear articles about it. But then somebody goes, you know, we found, um, you know, the, the, the gospel of whomever. And it's front page news all around the world. Right? Because it promotes a theory that we want to promote that undermines the Bible. Then you find out that it wasn't authentic, and nobody hears about that, right? But what we find here in this text is, again, over 301 eyewitnesses to the resurrection who were still alive when 1 Corinthians was written. Why is this important? This is important because that means that the gospel message, that the message of the Bible is falsifiable. It was falsifiable. This is important. When you're testing the veracity of a claim, if somebody's making a claim and that claim can't be falsified, that means you can't test the claim, right? Not a very strong claim if you can't test the claim. That means you, I just got to trust you because there's nothing I can do to falsify your claim. I just got to trust you. This claim was falsifiable. When Paul wrote it, it was a falsifiable claim. And yet it was never falsified. That's a piece of evidence that has to be weighed. Okay? A reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. But there's a problem. And here's the problem. The problem is, you know, we're all educated people. And unfortunately, we're overeducated people. Because um, we have truth and lies and everything else. And because we're overeducated people, um, all of us um, believe we know things about this claim. Um, this whole claim that, you know, we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. You know, that's not exactly true. This stuff was actually written later. I mean, it, isn't that right? Haven't we heard that? that? This stuff was written later, you know, and then there's this Constantine guy, you know, and, and he, he, he put stuff together, and then he said, get rid of other stuff, and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And um, so there are a couple of things that we need to deal with when we talk about the Bible in this way. Again, a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. I'm claiming 
that the Bible's written early. I'm claiming that the New Testament is written early. I'm claiming that the New Testament is done with by the end of the first century. Early, maybe into the second century, depending on um, how you date uh, Revelation. But that, the, but, it, but that it's early. That it's very early. And there are those people who are, you know, they're going to argue against this on a couple of different fronts. I'll deal with um, the easier one first. That the Bible is not reliable because it's been translated so many times. You can't trust what we have because it's been translated so many times. So maybe what he is saying is true <laughs> about something out there somewhere, but it's not true about what we have today because it's been translated so many times. Have you heard this? Come on, I need hands. I need hands. You've heard this. Okay, great. I've heard this. I've, people have told me, people at reputable schools have told me about professors who've made this claim. Um, the people who make these claims, this particular claim, are either ignorant or evil or both. <laughs> and I'm not just being mean. Let me explain to you why. Because the Bible's been translated so many times, and they'll say it's like a game of telephone. All right? The game has different names in different parts of the world, okay? But you know the game, you, you whisper into the ear of this person, and then he whispers into his ear, he whispers into his ear, so on and so forth. And then we come all the way down here, and you have to tell me what this guy whispered into your ear. By the time it gets to you, it sounds nothing like what I whispered into the ear of the first person, right? And so this is the argument that they make about the Bible being translated so many times and about us not being able to trust the Bible because of how many times it was translated. Um, this bothers me a great deal. It bothers me a great deal that there are people who claim to be intelligent who continue to make this argument, and it bothers me that there are Christians who don't laugh at them. <laughs> because here's the problem. If I am the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic manuscripts, I don't just whisper into his ear and then everybody else have to hear what I told him. See, I'm, I'm, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Um, this translation was done in the early 2000s. They didn't just go back to the next oldest translation and translate from that. They went to the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic manuscripts themselves, which means the game actually goes like this. I speak to him, and then I speak to him, and then I speak to him, and then I speak to him, and I speak to him, 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 and then I speak to him, so that when he says what he heard, it's the same thing that that guy heard because he got it from the same source. That's why people who make this argument are either ignorant or they're evil or both. How can any intelligent human being argue against the validity of the Bible because of the number of times it's been translated. Listen, if you would bother to go learn how to read Hebrew and Greek or Aramaic, you could go to the source yourself. These translations can be tested. There's software that you can use to test these translations against the documents that they're translating. There's no hiding here. In fact, we are more capable today than we've ever been at translating the Bible. Yeah, well, the documents that we have are just late documents, and we don't know what there were in those earlier documents. Okay. Um, all right. Let's look at that for a moment, shall we? When we're talking about the manuscripts themselves. Because um, there are some, some issues that we have to talk about there. Um, when it comes to the Bible, it's true. We don't have originals because of the material that these originals were written on. We don't have originals. Um, but let's limit ourselves tonight just to the New Testament, shall we? Um, just when we're talking about the New Testament, we don't have any originals. Um, but we do have um, documents that date back as early as A.D. 120, A.D. 100 to A.D. 120. Um, that's within a couple of decades of the completion of the New Testament. We can go back and put our hands on documents that were dated within a couple of decades of the completion of the New Testament. Um, how many manuscripts do we have? Uh, the New Testament, we have over 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts in the New Testament. Over 6,000. 
over 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts, and we can go back to within a couple of decades of the last writings. If, if that doesn't sound impressive to you, it's because you don't deal with ancient writings. For example, if we're talking about Aristotle's poetics, we have less than a dozen manuscripts of Aristotle's poetics, and the earliest one that we can go back to is over a thousand years after the writing. Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. Again, less than a dozen. And it's over a thousand years between the last writing and the first manuscript we can put our hands on. The best example that we have in terms of number of documents is Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad, we have a few hundred manuscripts, but the earliest one we can put our hands on is written 2,100 years after the original. And people have the audacity to question the New Testament. That's ridiculous. If it was a fight, they'd stop it. They wouldn't even let it start. If the Bible is not considered reliable or trustworthy in an institution like this, then there is no ancient document that should ever be considered trustworthy at an institution like this because none comes close to the Bible. Yeah, well, but then we know that there's the, so the whole overzealous monk theory, right? And that it's these monks and it's this Constantine guy. Um, again, that's more Dan Brown than it is... Okay? That's Da Vinci Code. That's the movies. That's, that's, not, that's not actual history. Um, but but even, even, if we, even if we were to go there, okay, there's a few problems. Number one, there's a manuscript problem, and there's 6,000 Greek manuscripts or portions of manuscripts. So if we have these you know, monks during the time of Constantine who are going to go back and who are going to change the New Testament, they would have to find 6,000 Greek manuscripts and portions of manuscripts, change them all the exact same way, don't show your ink work, don't get caught, never tell anybody what you did. There's a second layer of problem. You know, Jesus said, go and make disciples of pantata ethne, every people group, every ethnic group, right? Problem with people groups is they speak different languages. So within the first couple of centuries, the New Testament is translated into Syriac, Coptic, and Latin. So now, your overzealous monks during the time of Constantine have to go find 6,000 manuscripts, change them all the exact same way, don't show your ink work, don't get caught, don't tell anybody what you did. Then learn how to lie in Syriac, Coptic, and Latin <laughs> as well as you lie in Greek because if you don't, there's going to be a problem because now the Greek manuscripts won't match the translations into these other languages. So you got to change those, right? And then again, don't show your ink work, don't get caught, don't tell anybody. There's a third layer of problem. The early church fathers. The early church fathers had this horrible habit of quoting and writing commentaries on the New Testament. So much so that if all we had were the writings of the early church fathers, we would be able to reproduce the New Testament all but 11 verses. So now, our overzealous monks have to find 6,000 Greek manuscripts, <laughs> lie, don't show your ink work, don't get caught, don't tell anybody what you did. Learn how to lie in Syriac, Coptic, and Latin as well as you lie in Greek. Go get all those things from around the world. Make sure your lies match, get them back. Don't tell anybody what you did. Find all of the writings of the early church fathers and make sure that their commentaries now match all the lies that you told in Syriac, Coptic, Latin, and Greek. That's fantasy. That's fantasy, okay? That's absolute fantasy. So we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, all right? So far, we just got a good history book. Now it gets good. Back in our passage. Verse 17. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father... And the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Now we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, and they report supernatural events. Let's say that together. 
We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, and they report supernatural events, not superhuman events. Superhuman events, that's like sports highlights, okay? These are supernatural events. They're talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. They're talking about when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, and he was visited, and he saw Moses, Elijah, and Peter said, we just need to build some stuff right here and never leave. This was awesome. The Bible is not just a bunch of rules about religion. The, 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 the Bible is a, a collection of supernatural events. These men claim that Jesus healed the sick. These men claim that Jesus walked on the water. And the pièce de résistance. <laughs> Friday, he was dead. Sunday, he was risen. These are not just the writings of a religious community trying to pass down their rules and regulations. We have those. You can go to Qumran and you can, you can find those, right? That's what, that's what we have at Qumran. Um, by the way, we also have a collection of Old Testament books that were older than anything that we had before the 1940s when we found the Qumran scrolls. But again, that's the Old Testament. We, we don't even have time to get into all of that as well. But these individuals are saying that there are supernatural things that happen. When Moses crosses the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army is drowned, again, this is supernatural. These are the types of things that we have in the Bible. But not only are they supernatural events, but they're supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. We're not talking about you know, general Nostradamus type prophecies. Okay, we're, we're not talking about faith healer prophecies. Doesn't take a whole lot for me. I mean, I, if I just know anything about the human condition, I know. I mean, there's somebody in this room, you're suffering from a back condition. <laughs> right? There's somebody in this room and you lost your job not long ago. There's somebody, you, I mean, in a room this size, you know, that, that's not what I'm talking about here. That's not the kind of prophecies that I'm talking about. The kind of predictive prophecies that I'm talking about. I'm talking about, for example, the prophecies in Isaiah 53, for example. In Isaiah 53, um, Isaiah, over 700 years before Jesus was born, prophesies that Jesus will be born and that he will be the suffering servant. Um, Isaiah 53 is a powerful passage, but maybe it's not old enough for you. It is a powerful passage. Um, I take trips to Israel, taking several trips to Israel to lead tours, and um, I've met some folks there who are part of a group called One for Israel, and they do um, outreach to Jews in Israel. And one of the things that they do is just called the Isaiah 53 Project. And one of the individuals, he's an American, he went over, he did, actually did military service um, with the Israeli military. He lives there now. He serves at the Bible College there now. And, and, you know, oftentimes they will read Isaiah 53 and they will ask their Jewish friends and counterparts, I'm going to read something for you and I want you to tell me who it's about and where it's from. Um, and then the Jewish calendar, the way the Jewish reading year goes, um, there are a number of things that they don't read in their, in their reading year. One of the things that they don't generally read, generally read is Isaiah 53. They read 52, they read 54, but they won't read 53. And so this gentleman had his Bible that he got from the military. He was talking to a friend of his that he had served with in the military. He said, I want to read you something. You tell me who it's about and where it's written. He reads Isaiah 53. This gentleman says, that's about Jesus. It's in the New Testament. And all he does at that time is remove the book that he had behind this Hebrew Bible and shows the man, no, this is from your Hebrew Bible. That's Isaiah 53. Immediately, the gentleman just became angry because he knew what that meant. That the life and death of Jesus was in fulfillment of prophecy. But we're not going to go there tonight. I'm just not old enough. I need something older. 700 years. Come on, man. You know, what's 700 years? How about we go back over 1,000? 
And we go back over 1,000, we go to Psalm number 22. Now, if I wanted you to turn to Psalm 22, let's say we're first century, let's say we're you know, Jewish people, we're talking about the Bible in Aramaic, I wouldn't be able to tell you to turn to Psalm 22. We've only had chapters and verses for the last several hundred years. Um, I would have had to tell you to turn to the title of Psalm 22, which would have been the first line. I would have had to tell you, open your scroll to Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar? This is what Jesus says while he's on the cross. So Jesus quotes the title of a song while he's being crucified. Now, if I say, pass me not, O gentle Savior, what's the next thing that comes to your mind? Hear my humble cry. Hear my humble cry, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Save the wretch left me. Right? And that's just here. What if I was about to be executed? And I said the first line of a song. And then you watched me die. You'd probably think about the rest of that song the whole time I was dying. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Look at verse 6. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All those who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. That's what's being said to Jesus. That's how he's being mocked while he's being crucified. Go down to verse 12. Many bulls have encompassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Why? Because you're nailed to a tree. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. Interesting. After he dies, they pierce him in the side, thrusting upwardly. They pierce the pericardium and blood and water rush out. Look at the next this. My strength is dried up like potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws, which would make you say, I thirst. You lay me in the dust of death. Verse 16, for dogs encompass me. That is a reference to Gentiles. Guess what Roman soldiers are? Gentiles. A company of evildoers encircles me. <laughs> He's crucified between two of them. They have pierced my hands and feet. By the way, not everyone who was crucified was pierced in the hands and feet. Some were just tied to the cross so that it took days for them to die. I can count all my bones um, they break your bones in order to hasten your death. Jesus was crucified right before a high holy day. He needed to die quickly so that his body wasn't hanging on the cross during the Passover. But they didn't have to break his bones because he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So none of his bones were broken when he was crucified. They stare and gloat over me and they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Um, that was written a thousand years before Jesus was ever born and it was written by a man who never once in his lifetime saw a crucifixion. Well, how do you know? Um, because crucifixion had not yet been invented. That's how I know. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. And this is why Peter says in verse 19, we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. He's saying, listen, these, these fulfilled prophecies, the, <laughs> again, these aren't necessarily going to save you. You say by grace, grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But maybe you're here tonight and you say, well, I, I hear all that, but I still don't believe. Hey, hey, pay attention to it, though. Pay attention to fulfilled prophecy like a man out at night in the dark who sees a lamp shining. The human eye can see a lamp in the dark from over a mile away. And if you see it, what do you do? You watch it. You watch it and see if it's getting closer. He says, listen, if nothing else, if nothing else, if you sit here tonight and you say, well, I'm not convinced, that's fine. Just watch like you're watching a light in the distance until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Because that's what you need. You need the day to dawn. 
and you need the morning star, Jesus himself, to rise in your heart. You need to be made alive by him. That's what you need. But for now, watch. Don't take your eyes off this. Read about more of this. We don't have time to tonight, but read about more. Okay, our time is getting away from us. Let me end with this. He says, verse 20, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Finally, they claimed that their writings were divine rather than human in origin. So let's put it together. Together with me, we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. They claim that this is from God. Thousands of times. And the Lord said, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, and the Lord spoke to, and the Lord said, and thus saith the Lord. All over the Bible. This is God's words, not men's words. They're claiming that these are God's words. And by the way, when these prophecies are fulfilled, it gives credence to that, does it not? That this is God who is speaking. And oftentimes you have individuals who will say, well, I just, I just can't get there. I can't go there. Why? Because men wrote that. Men wrote that, and I just can't believe it. Then you can't believe anything written in any book. Because men wrote them. Right? That's ridiculous. Can't believe that. Why? Because men wrote that. Yet you believe yourself. Huh? Yeah. You don't believe what men wrote because you believe they might be fallible. You know that you're fallible, and yet you believe you. How can you believe you not believe in them? What makes you so trustworthy? But there's another problem. This whole problem, this whole idea that we have. You know, and I've had people say this. Yeah, well, you know, I'm just, I'm a man of science. And unless these types of things can be proven to me scientifically, then I just have a, I just, oh, whoa. When people say that, I just want to give them a hug. <laughs> I really do. I really do. I really do. Because they believe that they're so super intelligent and they're demonstrating their ignorance. I just want to hug them. I just want to put my arm around them and say, listen, 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 listen. I'm telling you this because I'm your friend. Don't ever say that to anybody else. <laughs> because you do sound like an idiot. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I mean, you know, the scientific method. You understand the scientific method. Well, yes. In the scientific method, something has to be observable, measurable, and repeatable. Right? History is not observable, measurable, or repeatable. You don't use the scientific method to prove historical events. So if you say you need scientific evidence for this, you sound like an idiot. <laughs> you don't use the scientific method to prove historical events. You use the evidentiary method, like you would in a courtroom. So what do you do? Well, I don't know. You ask about reliability of sources. You ask about the corroboration of sources. You ask about the internal and external evidence that supports these sources. These are the kind of questions that you ask. Who are the witnesses? Are they reliable and trustworthy witnesses? Is this falsifiable? Are there other things that are contradicting this or are there other things that are confirming this? These are the kind of, kind of questions that you ask in the evidentiary method. And when you ask those questions, you come away with things like um, three continents, three languages, over 40 authors, most of whom never met one another. They write us 66 volumes. These volumes address hundreds of different subjects and topics and come together in a cohesive unit that tells one redemptive story. And it's written over a period of more than 1,500 years. Therefore, you have corroboration, you have reliability, you have 25,000, 25,000 archeological digs related directly to matters discussed in the Bible that have confirmed what we find therein. 
You have the writings of contemporaries who confirm what we find herein. Therefore, the intelligent man is not the man who says, I simply can't believe that. That's the fool. The intelligent man says, I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. And they claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. And if that's not enough, I tried it. Changed my life. <laughs> Listen, we're going to take a break for a couple of minutes. Wow. <laughs> now you understand why I needed to show this to you directly instead of trying to uh, do the research and, and get you that information. Uh, he presents it so well. He presents it so accurately. He's uh, easy to listen to. And so uh, what's your reaction? Uh, I, I want to hear from a couple of people. What's your, uh, what's your, re your reaction to what he says? First of all, he was very understandable. And he presented his case right off. And even though some information, a lot of the information that we have already gotten before, but the way he presented and explained it to us, it made it more uh, un like, I can do this. I can, I can answer somebody's question uh, by the way he presented it. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, I, go ahead. I love, I love but I love particularly like the way he led us to different scriptures that verified his points. Yes, uh, I, I thought it was a great presentation. Yeah, he let that line loose, didn't he? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes. I thought it was great, but was that the same guy you showed in the beginning? <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, yeah, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. The picture that I showed you uh, was a, a older, oh, was a newer picture. It was a more current picture than in this. This was done in 2014, I think. So this was six, seven, eight years ago. So yeah, he's gotten older. He's actually gone through at least one health issue that I know of. Uh, so his appearance has has changed a little, but it is the same person. Did, did you notice how we have studied bits and pieces uh -huh. of a lot of the things that he tied together? Right. And that was one of the things that I wanted you to catch. And why I have him near the end of our sessions is because I, I think he gathers all that, puts a bow around it and really makes it flow to where it's like, okay, I know this. I, I, I've heard this before. I know some of this stuff. And he, and he, and he just makes it so, um, uh, what's the word? I think you use, uh, Kay, just understandable, I guess. Yeah, yeah it is. And, and another thing I like when he stated his case, when he gave us the, the, the worst scenario of why people believe the Bible, and how he is, he compounded and explained that, yeah. uh, and he came, he went from the worst and then down to getting better and better. But when he ended up with the Malcolm X story, I thought that brought it home. That oh. was that was great. Yeah, when but be careful how you what you believe in and what changed changed your life. Yeah, yeah. When he he first time I. I I saw this video. He suckered me right in there. You know, I had, <laughs> two or three, I had two or three names on the top of my brain that I knew he was going to mention, you know, life change and Messiah and all this kind of stuff. And he said that was Malcolm X. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I knew I knew some of Malcolm X's um, biography and read a few of his books. But then it just really put things into perspective. And, and here's the pointed question. And we'll end with this. Why do you believe the Bible? And, 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 and by what authority, by, by what reason do you give the Bible authority over your, over your life? I mean, we're, we're thinking about a book that contains, you know, 
uh, historical documents yes, that you basically said as a Christian has the right to tell you how to live your life. You've really got to check and see why do you believe the Bible? And so maybe you say it's a collection of historical documents <laughs> and, and so forth. Uh, but I, I hope that really hit you. Um, if, if for some reason you do not believe the Bible, or if you've had questions about the Bible, you've been a skeptic, I hope this has answered some questions. And over the coming week, again, I want you to watch this video again. It is 57 minutes long, a little over 57 minutes long. Look at a few minutes a day or whatever, or, or sit down and look at the whole thing. But I want you to pick out his main points. Uh, there's several main points that he makes very clearly and, and make a few notes. And then at least three questions, write down at least three questions that you would have for him at the end of his, at the end of his lecture. Next week, we're going to talk about those questions. We're going to see, and it's not as long next week uh, video, next week's video is not going to be as long as this, but it is a question and answer uh, session. I mean, everyday questions that people have, uh, both believers and non-believers have about this subject. So um, it's going to be it's going to be good, as good as uh, this video. Any uh, yes, please. I tell you something that I don't like about it when he kept saying, you know, why do you believe? Mm -hmm. And talk about how many people wrote it. <laughs> then he said, but you believe what you wrote. <laughs> Yeah. So in other words, you're gonna believe everything else you read, and they and it doesn't have as much people who wrote it and all the history behind it, and you won't believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's why he said they was ignorant. And he said, Don't don't tell people that, you know. But then <laughs> that makes you think. You look you read stuff and you believe it, then that it was one offer. Then the Bible has all these offers, all this research. And you don't want to believe it. Mm -hmm. So that gives you, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It makes you think. Yes. It makes you think. He does. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. You think about books that you have read and you believe what they said. Yeah. And then you look at people that say, I don't believe the Bible, but then you read this book. Yeah. Yeah. So think about your questions. It, it, it's great, that, and, and it seems like it's it's uh, it's kind of grabbed a hold of you, got you thinking, got you, uh, uh, you know, really kind of leaning on the Bible and maybe believing a little more than you uh, did before. But I want you to put your skeptic hat on, which is which is okay. It, it, you know, we're not into group think here. We're not into everybody thinking the same thing. Uh, I want you to put your skeptic hat on. And come up with uh, three questions, at least three questions that you would have for him. And we'll talk about that next time. A uh, little over time today. I really apologize. I, I, I know it's a long video, but I really hope that it was worth it. Uh, and so let me, uh, our, our live group here, hold on for just a second. Let me say goodbye to our recording uh, folks. Thank you so much for pushing a few buttons and taking a look at this. I pray that it was uh, good for you. And we're praying for you and see you next time. Thank you.